Hey, everybody, would you take your cell phone out for a moment? And those of you that are online, you can do this too. Take your cell phone out and scan the QR code in front of you because that QR code is going to tell you the top three things happening at Kingwood Church. Um, And there's one really, really big one happening in just a few hours tonight. Vacation Bible School is starting at 5.30. We have over 200 children registered And if you're here or watching online and in the local area and say, oh, no, we didn't register, it's okay. Show up tonight at 530, and we will be glad to register you in person at the door at that moment. So we want everyone who wants to come to have an opportunity to be here. Um, So if you'd like to be here, just show up tonight. If you have a child, grandchild, uh, whoever that you'd like to bring, we'd love to have you here. It's going to be a fantastic time. This is our third year to do it. And it's going to be really impactful uh, on children. So we want to ask you to bring your kids out tonight and be a part of that. Well, um, today is, as you may, uh, most of you already know, uh, Pastor Jeremy Sims and Hannah and their entire family, uh, their last Sunday with us at Kingwood. W- would, you, would you bring uh, that out, please? And so, uh, Jeremy, would you, would you come on over and... Um, Today, he is going to be sharing, continuing our series out of Hebrews, and he'll be sharing with us uh, for the last time. But today, before you do that, I have a gift uh, that I want to present to you on behalf of your Kingwood Church family in sincerest and deepest appreciation for 19 years of ministry. Uh, we want to present this gift to you, and you can open it later. It's fine. Uh, but it is a, it's a gift from our heart to you. And we hope that it'll be a blessing to you uh, as you go. So we've been, uh, you know, fighting back uh, tears and uh, all kind of things for a long time now. But today's the last day, and in a little while we'll have a prayer time. But what I want to do right now um, is I want to welcome for the final time uh, Dr. and Pastor Jeremy Sims to Kingwood Church. Would you welcome him? Thank you. That was ugly. <laughs> I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a, uh, one of the roles that I have here for the summer series is I get to, um, I schedule who, who preaches at what moment in the text and I lay out the, and, and I don't know why I thought it was a good idea for me to preach this day. I, that is the dumbest thing I could have done. I'm an absolute <laughs> I'm a, thank you, Brady. I'm an absolute wreck. Like I'm a mess. Wednesday night, y'all excuse me. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, thirsty. <laughs> Wednesday night was my last youth service, and I, I just, I was walking in, and I felt a lump in my throat, and I went, "Oh, this is going to be a long night. This is not going to be good." And so, I've just been a mess. I've been a wreck. I. Uh, In 1998, the summer of 98, May, actually uh, the end of April, right at the beginning of May, in 1998, I went to um, Niceville Assembly of God to intern with Jay. Jay was a youth pastor in Niceville, and that's where youth ministry started for me. I was, uh, I got to be a middle school boys small group leader, and if you ever think that you're called to youth ministry, I think the rite of passage should be go be a middle school small group leader. And if you still want to do youth ministry after that, you're, you are a hundred percent called. Like if you, if you can make it through that, that gauntlet of, of uh, puberty, then you definitely are called to youth ministry. So Jay, I am, uh, I, I don't want to, golly, this is, I'm a wreck. I'm just a mess. But, uh, I, I think that it's, when you look back, you know, you never know in the middle of things. Um, you, you don't, it's really hard to see the handiwork of God and the movement of God and the way that he's doing things in the middle of something. 
So what has to happen is you have to look back and then you start seeing how God is just intricately moving things around. And so to be able to be, to be able to walk in with UJ in 1998, the summer of 98 and, um, start youth ministry and then to finish here with you, um, 25, 25 years later, it's, um, it's a, it's a big deal to me. And so, uh, I'm going to have to get it together or else this is, we're going to be here for like three hours. <laughs> and there are a couple of you in here that would be like, we'll stay with you, Jeremy. And then some of y'all are in here like, my stomach's already rumbling. You just wind down now. I'm over this. So Jay gave me some great advice. And he said, um, a couple months ago, he said, look, when you preach on, on July the 9th, he said, don't try to s- summarize 25 years of ministry, local church ministry. He said that, that it's just hard to do that in a sermon. Just preach the book of Hebrews because that's what we're doing. And so as I was preparing for today, it was so much easier to, to just say, I want, I want the day to be about Hebrews. Like I want it to be about the text. That's what this moment, that's what this pulpit is. It has to always be about. It always has to be about Jesus and, and the way that Jesus is revealed in scripture. And so today that's what I want to do is I want to preach Hebrews and, uh, um, you know, I, I will end conversations with you and seen some notes on Facebook and different things. That's where I'll get to, to reflect, but I, I want to, I want to preach Hebrews today. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. I will tell you, I cheated a little bit since I'm the, um, since I get to lay out everything, um, <clears throat> I, uh, next week, pastor Clark is going to preach from Hebrews chapter 10. And then the next week, pastor Mark is going to preach from Hebrews chapter 11. But I just jumped ahead and said, since I'm laying this thing out, I'm going to preach from Hebrews chapter 12. So I've, so I've cheated a little bit because it just, I just wanted to preach from this text and, and Mark and Clark gave me permission. Um, but even if they would have said, no, we're going to preach on that. I'm first. So like I would have preached on whatever I wanted to. So like, what are they going to do? I'm the one with the microphone. So So Hebrews chapter 12, verse one says this, therefore, so just to give you an idea, every time you see a therefore in scripture, it's always referring back a chapter or two or five or 10. And so what's just happened in Hebrews chapter 11 is the writer of Hebrews has given us this litany of men and women who were um, just um, anchors of the faith those that had gone before and lived out the faith. And what's beautiful in, in this is that they don't have it all together. While they are uh, amazingly um, lived out their faith, on the one hand, you've got people like Abraham and David that are in there that just messed up, a, messed up sometimes and did dumb stuff sometimes. And yet they're still listed in this litany of faith leaders that we get to have. So that gives us hope. So, so uh, verse 12 says, therefore, and it's talking about after reading all of chapter 11 and seeing all of the men and women that lived out their faith in such a way that they were called faithful. Um, therefore, here we are. Therefore, uh, chapter 12, verse one, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. So in Hebrews 12, he's talking about this great cloud of witnesses in chapter 11. He's about to give us this really cool metaphor, the, the writer of Hebrews about how we're in this stadium and we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and uh, they're cheering us on. And I, I, I wanted to make note of this today. I am um, everything that I am today as a, as a minister, everything that I am as a pastor and everything that I am as a minister, everything that I am is called by God is because of the great cloud of witnesses that has surrounded me. And there are two groups that I think of when I think about that. And the first one is of course my family who is over here I have my parents, I have Tiffany's parents, and I have Hannah's parents over here that are here to love us and to support us. And then all of our, and uh, represented by our siblings one way or another, whether, uh, whether they're online or they're sitting over there. Uh, we have grandparents over there, uncles and aunts. And, and I, I just want you to know it's, it's a very big deal to me that you're here, but not just here in this moment, because this moment is just a, it's kind of the culmination of the last 25 years. And then on top of those 25 years, all of the, you know, the years growing up as well. And to be here, everything that I am, the person that I've become is because of you. So you are my great cloud of witnesses and um, I'm grateful. And then of course, my second great cloud of witnesses is you. You have been so good to me and my family. 
every iteration of it. Uh, ever, and, and we're done iterating, by the way, with our family. <laughs> this is the final iteration. This is the final iteration. So like, if you want to put, if you want to write us down, I, you know, you, as you would pray for our family, I think you realized you needed to write it down in pencil because it was going to be changing ever so often, but you can write it down and like, you can get a Sharpie permanent marker. Now this is how you can, you can pray for us this way. This is the last iteration of this family. So, um, but you have been so good to, to me and to us. And when I read this scripture and I think about a great cloud of witnesses, you, my family and you are, are that for me. You have loved us, you've supported us, you've prayed for us, you've given to us, and, and, and I could not be more grateful. Um, when I first started ministry, I had this idea that God saw these gifts and these talents and he wanted to use those to go change, to go be a part of the transformation of people. And I'm, I'm sure that some of that is true. What I didn't realize is that ministry was a gift that God had given me. It was a gift and an invitation that he said, if you'll serve well, if you'll love people well, that it is the pathway to my heart for you, specifically for me. And I have loved serving and praying for you and, and uh, ministering and ministering with you. And so you are my great cloud of witnesses. And I love you with all of my heart. Thank you, Preston. I hear you, man. Preston said, I said, he said, man, when are you leaving? He came in today. When are you leaving? I said, man, I'm leaving this weekend. He said, where are you going? <laughs> so I'm, I'm moving to Florida. Have you ever been to Florida? I don't know. Okay. So <clears throat> I hear you, Preston. Oh, let us throw off everything. Sorry. Uh, good luck keeping up with me today. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You and I are in a race. You and I are in a race. The writer of Hebrews uses it as a metaphor for our faith journey. And it is not an easy race as laid out. He uses Jesus as the uh, perfect example of our race. But we're in a race. We're in this stadium. There's a great cloud of witnesses. And the writer of Hebrews says, let me share with you some things in order to encourage you to finish your race well. I'm not gonna stand here in front of you today and say finish well, because I feel like I'm literally halfway through with my ministry journey. I've done 25 years, and if God will let me, I wanna do 25 more years plus, 25, 25 more years of, of, of ministry, and I feel like I'm in that middle place. So as a fellow racer, as a fellow person who is running this race, I wanna encourage you through Hebrews today to, to look straight ahead, to fix your eyes on Jesus, and to run the race with everything that you can. And so today I want to look at three quick thoughts in Hebrews that just says, this is how to run your race and to run it well. The first thought is this, get rid of every heavy weight that is slowing you down. Hebrews 12, one says, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. What is slowing you down from looking at Jesus and running this race toward maturity in Christ. What is it? What is it that's slowing you down? What is it that is hindering you? He lists, he says, throw off everything that weighs upon you and then also throw off every sin. So as I began to think about my life, especially these last 25 years, about what are those things that have tried to slow me down, there were two that just kept coming back over and over again, both as I looked at my, my life but then also as I looked at the life of those that I love and that I serve. And the first one is this, you're gonna, you're gonna think, well, man, this is so simple. And it is, it is so simple to, to identify, not so easy to, to change. But the first thought is just this, it's just busyness. What is it that keeps us from being able to fully mature in Christ? We have this, we have this lifestyle and culture that continues to just perpetuate busyness in our lives. We're constantly going and going and going and making less and less and less time for those things that help us to mature as followers of Jesus. 
when I was growing up, uh, I became a preacher's kid in 10th grade. So I've been both a not a preacher's kid and a preacher's kid. Um, and then, of course, served in this church. I've served in four churches. I've served in this church for 19 years. But for the majority of my life, church was the center of my spiritual life. How many of you grew up where we went to church a lot? How many of you went to church a lot when you were growing up? Man, we went to church so much when I was growing up. I, uh, I was thinking about it. Like we went to, we did uh, um, on Sunday mornings, we did Sunday school. Remember Sunday school? And then we did Sunday church. And then we did Sunday night church. Y'all remember Sunday night church? There used to be, I don't know if y'all remember this, there used to be church on Sunday nights. Like we used to do that. So there's Sunday night church. And then we would have a midweek service, midweek service. And back then, nobody cared if kids slept. If you were in church, it was like, well, they're getting the rest of the Lord there. So we would be there it's like nine or 10 o'clock at night. And, and then we would go home and drag in and have to take shower. You know, you, you'd get like four hours of sleep before you went to school the next day. And so we just did a lot of church. We had that midweek church. And then where I grew up over at Gary Wood, over in Hueytown, every summer we had a camp meeting. Did y'all ever do camp meetings? I remember one year my, my mom said to us, um, hey, we're going to go to camp meeting this, and we're going to go to every single night of camp meeting. To give you an idea what that is, I mean, I was like 12 years old and it was two weeks every night in the middle of the summer. Can you imagine being 12 years old and spending every night for two weeks? I mean, the, the summer is the gift to me. Like, I don't have to go to, I don't have to go to school. I don't have to do anything. I can stay up late and play the Nintendo, like the real one. I can stay up late and I can play and I can sleep in. No, we went to church all of the time, all the time church. When I got here, there was Sunday school, there was Sunday morning, there was Sunday night. Then after Sunday night, we would all go over into, into the Cafe Mundo. Y'all remember this? We'd go over there and we'd, and we'd stay around and we would eat and we would all take turns fixing food. And everybody dreaded being the food fixers, but we all wanted to be out there and eat the food. And we would eat good food, bad food. It didn't matter because it was never about the food. We just wanted to be over there and hanging out with each other. So we'd spend hours with each other and then midweek service. And then, but we did a lot of church. And here's what I want to say about this. I don't think that because we have less church that anything's wrong. Church serves, services serve a purpose. And the purpose is to help us to fully mature in Christ. And there's a lot of things that happen in a church service. Back then, we did everything in a church service. We were discipled, we served, we were ministered to, we fellowshiped, we used our gifts, we, um, we um, shared our faith, we would invite people to church. We did a, those things that help us to become a mature believer, a mature follower of Christ. We did all of those things. And back then we were going to church like five times a week. Now the average person goes to church one time every three weeks. That's the average. The average, the average church attendee in America goes to church once every three weeks. So we have had a 1500% decline in how we, how we um, show up to become mature followers of Jesus. And here's what I wanna say about that. If you expect the Sunday morning service to carry the full weight of the process by which you will be fully matured in Christ, you're never gonna become a mature believer. You can't do it because a, Sunday, because a service is one of the tools that God uses to mature us. It is not the way that we become mature in Christ. And what happens is, is we become so busy that we don't realize all of those other things we were doing, you can still do. It just doesn't happen in a service anymore. You still have to discover your gifts and you still have to fellowship with other believers. Acts 246 said that the believers got together every single day. They were together they fellowshiped, they took communion, they prayed for one another, and they saw miracles and healings every single day of the week. That's Acts 2.46. And we have this idea that we can just show up on a Sunday. I'm not saying you do, but I just, wanna, I just wanna challenge you. If your lifestyle shows that you believe that we can just show up on a Sunday morning once every three weeks and become a fully matured follower of Jesus Christ, it can't happen. It doesn't work that way. We can't show up. There are 168 hours in a week. 
And we can't show up for two of those and think that, G, that we're going to become like Christ. So busyness has overtaken our lives. And we've got to learn how to let the church equip us to become fully, fully devoted, mature followers of Jesus. And so what does your week look like that is helping you to be fully formed, mature follower of Jesus? How does your week look? Is your week just, I'm going to do all of the things that I normally do, and then I'm going to show up on a Sunday morning and try to get everything that I can to help form me, and it just will not happen. You and I are constantly being formed. We're constantly being shaped. I'm being formed, and I'm being shaped at all times of my life. When I am around the people of God, I'm, I'm being formed by the body of Christ. When I'm not around the people of God, it's possible if I'm not careful that I'm being deformed by the culture. And we don't even realize sometimes how influential that um, those moments are. And so the more that I can get around the body of Christ and allow the body of Christ to form me, the greater opportunity I have to become a fully devoted, mature Christian. I'm thirsty again. The second thought, and I'm only going to spend a second on this. But the second, so the first thought is busyness. How do I strip away those things that, that are holding me back from being a fully mature follower of Jesus Christ? The second one that I see that is one of the most difficult obstacles to becoming a mature follower of Jesus is unforgiveness. It is the greatest relational need that every one of us have in this entire building, and it is broken relationship and unforgiveness. And all I want to do is encourage you. I feel like, I feel like God taught me more about maturity when he taught me about forgiveness than any other space in my life. The more, that, the more that he taught me about what true forgiveness is and what unforgiveness does, the more that I realized that he was actually growing me to become more like Jesus. You're talking about the Jesus that was hanging on a cross that said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're up to. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're, what, what's even happening in this moment. And, and uh, I just want to say this about forgiveness. There's this idea in church sometimes that I can just come to an altar and ask for God to help me to forgive someone and it will be gone. I'll just let it go. And I want to tell you in my experience, let it go is a Disney song. It's not a reality. Like it's not, like I don't know how to let, I don't know how to let it go when someone has hurt me very deeply or has hurt my family very deeply. So a better definition, definition of forgiveness is not let it go. A better definition is the daily intentional decision to not seek revenge. The daily intentional, I wake up in the morning and I say, I choose to forgive today. I choose to, I, I choose to not seek revenge. And you're like, well, I'm not, a venge, I'm not a vengeful person. I'm not gonna seek revenge. Let me share with you some of the ways that we seek revenge, just to, just to get it on your radar. One of the ways that we seek revenge is by gossiping, by bad-mouthing, by posturing, by manipulating conversations to control the perception of another person. One of the things that God told me a few years ago was this. You can defend yourself or you can let me defend you, but we're not going to do both. And so I, I stopped trying to manipulate conversations in such a way to posture myself to look like I was in the right and somebody else was in the wrong. And I said, I'm going to let God, I'm going to let God do all of the defense. Sometimes we mentally hope the worst for another person or that nothing good would happen to another person. That's seeking revenge. Sometimes we celebrate bad karma or what we call you reap what you sow. We're, we're saying, well, yeah, they deserve it. Look how they've treated other people. And we celebrate that moment. Or we do these subtweets or passive aggressive attacks on, on social media. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you probably don't do it. If you do know what I'm talking about, uh-oh. Or sometimes we don't give an opportunity for a person to have a second chance. You become God when you hold someone to a higher standard than God holds you to. And so we have to give, God, we have to give people an opportunity to actually change. 
That's what this whole thing is about. That's why, that's one of the, that's one of the, the, my core beliefs as a pastor. I can't close the book on someone. I can't say they made a mistake, they did something wrong. The, uh, 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 what is it a leopard can't change his spots? Does a leopard have spots? Whatever has spots, can't change his spots, whatever that is. Uh, I can't say those things because God has the ability, what is it? It doesn't matter. Okay, uh, a zebra can't change its stripes. <laughs> Fix it. Uh, I'm not even sure that works. But, uh, but I can't close the book on someone else. And you seek revenge and unforgiveness when you close the book on another person. When you say that's who they are, they're never going to change, and God can never do anything in their life. So to me, with those things that we have to get rid of in order to become fully mature followers of Jesus Christ, we have to change the busyness of our lives to, and, to, and incorporate those things that God is calling us to that forms us to be like Jesus, and we have to let go of unforgiveness. We have to learn to forgive. The second thought is this, is we have to run with perseverance. Hebrews chapter 12 says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. You only need perseverance if something is hard. Like, you and I don't need perseverance if things are easy. And what the writer of Hebrews is telling you is that following Jesus is going to be hard. In fact, Jesus tells us that following him is going to be hard. He says, in this life, you will have trouble. In this, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. When Jesus says, I have overcome the world, what he is saying is the world doesn't get the final say. When I was 33 years old, and I know some of y'all are like, man, last year? No. No, I'm 46. 46. So if you want to do the math, I said, I want to do 25 more years of ministry. I want to do, I want to, I want to, man, I, I hope God will give it to me. I want to do well. Um, when I was 33, I went on a retreat. Jay let me go on this retreat to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I got up there and uh, I, 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 it was just a personal retreat. I went all by myself and I just, I, I felt this urging to to begin to do retreats for myself once in a while where I would just get alone with Jesus and I would try to, um, I would try to grow my relationship with Jesus, not because I was a pastor, but because I just loved Jesus. And so I was up there on this retreat and I remember um, I was with this guy's name was Tom who, who became a mentor of mine. Uh, I wish I could tell you all of the stories about Tom, just an unbelievable man. Uh, but he became a mentor. I was, I was in this, and somehow we got into this conversation and he was talking about going through life struggles. And I said to him at 33, I said, Tom, I, honestly, I've never really had any life struggles. Like life has been pretty, following Jesus has been really easy for me. And I never will forget because of what happened a year later, I never will forget. He said, just wait. And he wasn't, he wasn't like speaking death over me. He wasn't speaking um, something that I would live into and something bad would happen. He was just saying, hey, if you walk with Jesus long enough, you will have difficulty. There are going to be some things that are going to happen in your life that are tough, that are, that are, that are very difficult. It is, it, it is part of being a human. You and I are followers of Jesus, but we're also humans. And being a human means that difficulty is going to happen in life. Following Jesus doesn't stop you from being a human. It just helps to encourage us and change our perspective of those things. And so a year later, you know, I found out that Tiff was sick. And over the next seven years, she fought, that, she fought this disease before she died. And then the next several years after that, walking through just grief with my kids. So at least 10 years of, of just difficult working through stuff. And I remember thinking one day, I was like, God, I, this, is, this is so hard for me. Where are you? 
Are you going to do anything? Are you going to heal? Are you going to, are you going to change this circumstance? And I remember asking those things and I remember God dropping into my heart, Jimmy, you're going to have to at some point take a leap of faith with me. Faith requires us to take a step without any evidence. And and I'd like to just mention this to a few of you in this room today. And I just want to say this idea. If you're waiting on Christianity to make sense, 100%. If you're waiting on God to answer all the questions, and if you're waiting on God to make sense, it's never going to happen. You're never going to get an answer to every question, and God is never going to make total sense. If God were to make total sense, he would be a pretty small God. So if you're waiting on God to make sense, and if you're waiting on every question to be answered, and if you're waiting on God to fix things and make everything work right the way that, you've, the w- way that you want it to work, it's never going to happen. And in this life, God has called us, and I don't know in the grand scheme of why, but in this life, God has called us to take a leap of faith and to trust him. And so as I was going through this difficult season in my life, God dropped in my spirit and said, I felt like I heard him say this to me. Don't take a leap of faith on my actions, on what I do, on what you think I'm supposed to do. Take a leap of faith on my character. If you're going to choose to believe something that is hard to believe, choose to believe something about my character. And I began to believe 10 years ago, I remember writing it down in my journal and I said, I choose to believe that God is good, that God loves me, and that God is with me every moment of my life. That he will never leave me, he will never forsake me, and that in every moment of my life, he is with me. And that's where I chose to take my leap, leap. not in can God heal, or can God do a miracle, or should he, or why would he, I I, I chose not to take that leap. Because what happens is, When we choose to take a leap on the activity or the action of God and God doesn't do what we want him to do, then we are left with, then maybe there is not a God. If God doesn't act the way that God's supposed to act, then there must not be a God. And what I'm telling you to do is don't take a leap on the activity of God, on God acting like he's how you and I think he should act, but instead take a leap on the character of God on the belief that God is always good, God is always loving, and God is always with me no matter what I'm going through. And when I do that, and life doesn't look like it's supposed to look, and God doesn't act like God's supposed to act, I don't instead begin to doubt the existence of God and his, in, in his presence in my life. Instead, what I do is I begin to look for his existence and presence in my life. And can I tell you, when I began to do that, when it clicked for me and I said, okay, If God's not going to do anything, if he's not going to heal or not going to heal the way that I think he should, but I'm going to believe that God's here and present and blessing and he's, and he's, and he's good. Where is he? And all of a sudden I began to see God everywhere. I began to see God inside of you. God took care of me through the body of Christ. Scripture never says that the manifestation of the full presence of Jesus is in his power. It never says that the full manifestation of the presence of God is in a miracle or is in a healing. Scripture never says that. Scripture says that the full manifestation of the presence of God is in his body. That's where the full manifestation of his presence is. And I began to see God in you as you took care of us, as you prayed for us, as you gave to us, as you served us, as you loved us, as you upheld us. And I I can honestly tell you this right now, that I am who I am as as a follower of Jesus at whatever maturity level I am. I am who I am because I saw God in you. You were the full presence and manifestation of Jesus for me. You were the body of Christ for me. You were Jesus for me. And I was able to persevere and and am am able to persevere because of the, the strength of the full presence of the body of Christ. 
And the last thought is this. Fix your eyes on Jesus and follow his lead. Hebrews 12, 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, the one who has gone before us and shown us how to do this and the one who is perfecting us in the process. I want to tell you a story quickly because I'm over time, but I want to tell you a story with a sequence of events. But there are so many components. This is a story that's about two years. It's, it, it's taken two years to happen. But I can only tell you, I'm only going to tell you a few of the components. So I've kind of, I've, I've just listed a few of the pieces of it because I just want to give you this sequence of events. But I want, but here's what I want you to hear more than anything else. I never, I, I mentioned this a minute ago. I want to mention it again. I, I never was able to put these pieces of this story together while I was walking through the story while I was in the middle of it. I didn't recognize, I never said, oh, because of this and this, it looks like God is doing this. I was never, able, I just was so disconnected. They just happened to me and for me and with me and Hannah. They just happened kind of to us and I, and I couldn't connect the dots at the time. And what I'd like to tell you up front is this. God is, God is putting together these puzzle pieces in your life. There are these different pieces. And it is nearly impossible for you to see the full picture of what God is doing when you're living in the middle of a piece of the puzzle. The only way we ever see the full picture is when it's finished and we look back and we go, oh, so that's what was happening. And there are men and women and young people in this room that God is, God is, is intricately putting together these pieces, but you can only see a piece right now. And the piece doesn't necessarily make sense in light of the whole, but one day you'll look back when you'll say, so that was what God was doing. So that was what was, that's what was happening. Two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who is the executive vice president at Southeastern University. To give you an idea of what that means, he's just the boss. He's the, he's the boss. There's the president and there's him. And he's a friend of mine. He and I met when we were getting our doctorate. He was my roommate out at George Fox Seminary uh, when we were getting our doctorates together. He's my buddy, been friends. We would talk maybe once a year and catch up. Or we, we, we started in 2010, so he, talked, he called me up out of the blue. I hadn't talked to him in a very long time. He said, hey, uh, we're doing something down here at Southeastern that, I'm, that I, I, I want to live the rest of my life doing it. I'm so passionate about it. It's going to be called the Center for Sustainable Ministry. And the Center for Sustainable Ministry, what it is, is it is this ministry to pastors that, have, that are going through difficult things, but also pastors that will one day go through difficult things. He said, what we're noticing here in our network and our, and our relationships is that men and women are leaving ministry at a clip that we have never seen in our lifetime. Pastors are leaving ministry because of the weight, the burden of how hard it is, of how we don't feel like necessarily we were prepared to minister in a culture that we're living in right now. This, this is a tough time to, it's a tough time to be a Christian and it's a tough time to lead Christians. He said, so we want to develop this. We want to develop this ministry to pastors that can live thriving, sustainable ministries in light of the weight of heavy ministry. He said, and man, I, I was thinking about you and I want you to be a part of helping us figure this thing out. I'm going to bring in a bunch of, bunch of people from around the country in a few months and we're just going to start brainstorming this thing out on a whiteboard. Would you like to be a part? And something leaped inside of my heart. And I said, yes, absolutely. I want to be a part of that. I would love, that sounds so exciting. I would love to be a part of that. So months went by and finally was able, this was back in uh, like April or May. I still remember the phone call. I was at Jared and Morgan's house and I stepped outside. They were, Morgan was cooking us dinner. 
and I felt so bad. I know, did I ever tell you that, Morgan? I never told you this. You cooked us dinner a couple years ago, and I was such a terrible guest because I got this phone call, and I was like, I never get a phone call from this guy. And so I stepped outside, and I was at your house. I still remember stepping outside and going, what in the world? Okay, yes, I want to do this. I want to be a part of this. So a few months later, uh, he flew everybody in, bunch of bunch of people from around the country, but I wasn't able to go because we had a baby. <laughs> Hannah Hannah had a ha, Hannah birthed Emerson on October the fourth, and we had a meeting on October the fifth. And I said, Hannah, uh, I obviously would never ask to go to this meeting on October the 5th, would never ask, would you want me to go? No, I didn't say that, but I, but I said, I said, if we have a window, do you care if I just zoom, if I just zoom in on this? If I just, if I just sit in at the table and I'm, and I'm a, on a screen? And she said these words, I definitely want you to do this because I think the next chapter of our ministry life is attached to Chris. Chris is my friend's name. And so whatever he asks you to do, you just say yes to. It's like, okay. So I'm sitting in a hospital room on October the 5th while she's over there sitting in a, in a bed with our baby girl. And around this table are all of these guys that run at an altitude that I've never ran at pastor mega, mega churches, write books, lead massive organizations, run giant budgets, and then little me with my little head on a TV screen at the end of the table. And I said, I, I want to be a part of this. And so we talked and everybody took turns. And I remember at one point Chris saying, Jeremy, what do you think about that? And I just said my little piece and that was, the, that was the day. I was on there for about two hours. I hung up October the 5th. I got off the Zoom. And my, my, my spirit was just, it just was lit. It was on fire. And a couple days later, I sat down in my, with my journal. And I started writing. And I wrote these words. And I still can't believe I wrote them. But I wrote these words and I said, God... I don't want to be a part of that ministry. I want to lead the whole thing. I just think like, I just think that you're calling me to do that, but it doesn't, I wrote in my journal, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense on paper. I'm the last person at that table that would ever be asked. I'm a little youth pastor at a medium church in central Alabama. And there's, it doesn't make any sense for me to do that. So if you want it to happen, you make it happen. And I closed my journal. I told a couple friends and Hannah, I said, I just I want to do that one day. The next week, Joel, my brother, came to preach at the church. And uh, he preached a sermon on stepping out of the boat. Remember the story where... where uh, Jesus comes to the disciples and he's walking on water and Peter says, Jesus bid for me to come to you and I'll come to you. And, and, and Peter gets and walks onto the, onto the water. Remember that? And uh, he preaches this sermon on stepping out of the boat and walking with faith on the water. And he preaches it to us. It was just two years ago. And, and I, my spirit was so stirred. And so I called him the next day and I said, Joel, I, man, you preached and it was so to me. That sermon was so for me. I just feel like it's time for me to start preparing because I think in about five years, that's what I told him, in about five, in about five years, I think in my brain, because the reason was is because Braden was in eighth grade. And I said, I want, to be my, I want to be my teenagers. I want to be all of their youth pastor. So I was Addison's youth pastor, Carson's youth pastor. I've been Braden's youth pastor. I'm not going to be the youth pastor of my two babies. I, that is not going to happen. But, <laughs> but I will support their youth pastor. But I said, I want to... I want to be there. And so I said, so in five years, uh, I'm, I'm willing to start thinking about what's next. So, so I said, will you pray about with me? I want to start figuring out what are some steps that I can take to position me for the, for the second half of my ministry life. And Joel laughed. My little brother, 
My little brother with his wisdom laughed and he said, oh, that's not how this works. He said, you don't have five years. I went, what are you talking about? Yes, I do. I get to decide when, when, and, when and what I do around here. And he said, you don't have five years. When God puts something in your heart, it goes much faster than you think it will go. Okay. Now, I want to remind you again, these things that are happening, I do, I, I've never put them together. I've never, they just all were these disparate moments. The next week, we had soak at the church. And I, one of my favorite things to do at soak is to pray for you. And I was standing right there, and Sandy Bruce came over to pray with me. And she said, hey, Jeremy, we pray with me? I'm having surgery on something and, and blah, blah, blah. I, not that it's insignificant, Sandy, I apologize. But, I, but she said, it was just, and so I said, it was so important. In fact, you're healed because of my prayer. Um, so I prayed for her for, for like 60 seconds. I just, hey, it was, a, it was like a minor surgery, remember? Yeah, and so I prayed and love you, Sandy. And then she started talking to me. If you know Sandy, you'll be so surprised that she started talking to me. And she talked to me for about 10 minutes. And she just began to talk in Sandy style. Now, some of you know Sandy style. It basically is the things of God in such a way that I just was, I just was wide eyed and trying to listen. And she was quoting scripture and prophesying and she just was talking and, and God's going to do this and revival and, and the book of revelation, like all of the things that you can think. And she just was, and I was like, yeah, like, amen. Good Sandy. And then all of a sudden she said this, I still remember standing right there in October of 21. She went and now is it? And all of a sudden she went, Whoo! She did a Pentecostal woo. If you've never, if you've never experienced a Pentecostal woo, come to soap. We have them there. We have Pentecostal woos at soap. But she goes, whoo! And she took a step back, kind of Evelyn style, like God is just like, like the Holy Spirit just punched her in the gut. She just went, whoo! And took a step back, and I went, and immediately a tear went down my Ah, and I was like, uh oh. <laughs> and she said, oh, You're leaving. She said, God is. God has just opened a door for you, and you don't even know the door is open yet. And what opened the door is the pain of your past. And God is going to use that to heal. And she said, so tell me what's going on. And I said, nothing. There's nothing happening in my life right now. As far as I know, I'm here for the next five years. And she said, no, you're not. And tears streaming down my face. I went, Okay, I guess we'll see. <laughs> While that was happening, Hannah was over here praying and Suzanne came up to Hannah and said, hey, I just wanted you to know that God has changed the way that he's told us to pray for you and cheer me. God has told us to begin to pray for you that he's getting ready to do something different in your life and we're now praying for courage that when it's time, you'll have courage to step out in faith. Now, I want to tell you, uh, that all happened in October of 21. I want to tell you, I never put those things together. They all felt like these disparate, disconnected events. I never put them together. They never made sense to me as a whole. They all just were these one events where I went, oh, that's neat. Oh, that's sweet, Sandy. Okay, nice. Oh, that's nice, Suzanne. Thank you. Oh, that's cool, Joel. God's prepared. I never put any of them together. And for the next year and a half, my life looked like it looked like it looks. I just loved you and served. And in January of this year, I got a text. A year and a half later, I got a text. And all it said in the text was from my friend Chris. We hadn't talked in a while. It said, 
He's so, he's, he just runs so fast and so hard and he just runs at an out and he just, he just always cuts to the chase. He's not going to beat around the bush. He's just going to hear. And it just said these words, I need you down here running the center for sustainable ministry right now. And I went, I wrote back in all caps. I, I was one of those guys. I wrote back in all caps. What? And he called me on the phone and he said, Hey, I've been praying and God wants you to come down here and lead, be the director of the Center for Sustainable Ministry. And I said, why do you think that? That doesn't even make any sense. I told him, I said, it doesn't even make any sense. And he said, I was praying and God said, skip over all those other guys, you're the guy. All I ever wanted to do and all I've ever wanted to do is fix my eyes on Jesus and follow his lead. And I just wanna tell you this last thought and it's this. I would have been, I, w- I would be, and I would have been content serving you for the rest of my life. I just want to follow Jesus. I, Mark is one of my heroes, and I would often come to him and say, Mark, you've been here for a minute. Y'all know Mark's been here for a minute. How did you do it? And he and I would talk often about how would you do it? And I had no desire to do anything else except to love and to serve. I didn't want to be a lead pastor. I didn't want it. I just wanted to love and serve. And, and I fixed my eyes on Jesus and I followed his leading. And I just want to tell you in this moment, I think that God has said to me, keep following me. I have something different. So from the bottom of my heart, I love you with all of my heart. Everything that I am as a minister into this moment has been because of the way that you've loved me and you've allowed me to be too mature in Christ. I don't think that I will ever have it better than I have it right now. I don't think I ever will. You have, you've loved me so well and you've loved my family so well and I'm so grateful. And I, and I, and I, I covet and, 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 and uh, request your prayers um, and, 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 and I'm so grateful that God called me to love you and to serve you. It is It has been the greatest joy of my life. Please remain standing. We're going to sing a song.